Welcome to Easter worship at Grace Lutheran Church. I am Pastor Joanna Mitchell, and I am so glad you joined us for worship today as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. For our worship today, we are inviting you, if you choose to participate in Holy Communion from your own home, you need to gather at your table bread and wine or crackers and grape juice. Any type will do. These ordinary elements are extraordinary with the words of promise and blessing from God, who through Holy Communion invites us to taste the forgiveness and grace of God. You may not choose to participate in Holy Communion from your home. Please know that God's grace and presence is with you today and every day. It feels strange to know that our church buildings are closed on Easter Sunday this year. And yet, the first Easter began with concerns about a closed tomb. It began not inside a sanctuary, but out in the world. It began in darkness and in fear. The transforming power of Easter opened up the world. It opened not only the tombs, but the hearts, minds, and spirits of people everywhere. So that even when we walk in fear, we do so knowing God is with us in our fears, proclaiming a message of hope. We begin our worship this morning remembering the darkness of that first Easter morning. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who who was also by himself, waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoned the centurion. He asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph brought the linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in the tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. Then he rolled the stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, saw where the body was laid. As the events of last week echo in our hearts, we gather at the tomb. As we grieve the death of our Lord, we gather at the tomb. As our hope seems to die right before our eyes, we gather at the tomb. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. Resurrection starts with a cry of grief, an empty place, a familiar voice. But But death is not the end. As we gather at the tomb, The stone is rolled away. We are told the news by the angels and the women. The stone is rolled away. Why do you seek the living among the dead? The stone is rolled away. Christ is risen. Waiting for us to take notice. Christ is risen. Waiting for us to respond. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Christ is risen, giving us new hope, new promise, and new life. Today we gather in our homes, separated from one another physically, but united in spirit and heart as God's beloved children. We remember that first Easter morning of the women living in fear and sorrow. We recognize our own grief, our own fear, 
our own sorrow. We recognize that God works through death, pain, and sorrow in order to do something new. With a roll away stone and from an empty tomb, God proclaims an ever-ending power of love that will not die. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Blessed be the Trinity, one God who forgives all our sins, whose mercy endures forever. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of God the Holy Spirit be with all of you. And also with you.
Let us pray. O oh God, you are the creator of the world, the liberator of your people, and the wisdom of the earth. By the resurrection of your Son, free us from our fears, restore us in our image, and ignite us with your light. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives in the reigns of you and the Holy Spirit. One God, now and forever. Amen. Happy Easter! Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. It's so good to be with you all today. Um, right here on the steps where we normally meet. This is so fun. So I brought with me today some props. Does anybody know what this is? It kind of looks like, you're right, a carton of eggs. Well, let's open it up and see what's inside. <gasps> Those don't look like regular eggs. They're Easter eggs. You're right. And actually, these Easter eggs are really special because they tell us the story of Holy Week, the week that we've just been through into today, which is Easter morning. And so I'm wondering together if we could retell that story using my fancy Easter eggs. So we'll open them up and see what is inside. Last stunt Sunday, we started this week with what day? Does anyone remember? Palm Sunday. Absolutely. And Jesus came riding in on a donkey. Hee-haw, hee-haw. <laughs> it's kind of fun. So we've got that, and I've got little Bible verses that we'll go along with. So with the donkey, then the multitude who went before and those who followed cried out, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So the donkey on Palm Sunday. Then we came to the day, Maundy Thursday, which is where Jesus gives the new commandment to his disciples to love one another. We also learned that at that last meal, one of Jesus' disciples betrays him. His name is Judas. And Judas, I wonder what's in this egg. What does that sound like to you? Hmm. Judas betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. So I've got some silver pieces there. Then the one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him thirty pieces of silver. Then that same night at the dinner table, at the supper table, the last supper, Jesus and his friends were sharing a meal. Does anybody know what this is? Maybe it looks like something that we use at church sometimes. 
Yeah, it's a wine chalice. And our verse for this says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. Have you heard those words before? I think maybe you have when we have communion together. All right, let's see what's in this next egg. Shake it. Doesn't really sound like much, but this is where Jesus went after his meal with his disciples. So if we can think the order of the night, what happened after the meal? Jesus went to a garden to pray. And so in this egg, we've got prayer hands. Yeah, exactly. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as your will be done. Kind of sounds like the Lord's Prayer that we pray sometimes, doesn't it? All right, next, this one, I can barely hear what's inside. It's a piece of leather. Hmm. And I think this is to remind us of when Jesus was flogged before, after he was arrested, um, they would use the whip on Jesus. And so our verse for that is, so Pilate wanted to gratify the crowd, release Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. Hmm, I wonder what the next thing might be. This one has to do with Jesus on the cross. They put something on Jesus' head. Maybe you can guess what that might be. The crown of thorns. Exactly. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Hmm, what could this be? Oh, yes, the nails. The nail, they nailed Jesus to the cross. And so if you look really carefully, there's one, two, three nails, one for each hand and one for Jesus' feet. And when they mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. And if you noticed... The nails are also in the sign of a cross. Exactly. Then after they had tore Jesus' clothes from him, they did something with his clothes. They ripped them apart. And they, can you see what this is? It's a die. Yeah, like you would play a game with. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, or tossing the die, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. Next, let's see what we've got inside. Oh, a spear. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. So we've got a spear. Hmm. Oh, look at that. A linen. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb which he had hewn out of the rock against the door of the tomb, and he rolled a large stu stone against the door of the tomb and departed. So then I wonder what this could be. I think it might be a rock. Do you see it? There it is. Pilate said to them, you have a guard. Go on your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing it with a stone and setting the guard. Hmm. 
Now I wonder what could be in this last egg. I bet maybe you know. Let's, let's take a look. It's empty. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And the angel invited the women in to see the place where the Lord lay. There we have it. All of Holy Week in one nice little egg carton. Thank you for helping me tell the story and for following along. Can't wait to see you guys again soon. Happy Easter. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man, dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our God, our rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. They were afraid. This group of courageous, faithful women who walked to cemeteries at the first light of day in order to perform burial rituals, they were afraid. These women who had not fled and abandoned their friend when he was tried and persecuted and convicted by the Roman government, but instead had stood at a distance and watched as he was killed, and they didn't leave. They were afraid. These women who, after he had died, had shown up and watched as Joseph of Arimathea had taken his body and laid it in a tomb. None of those other things seemed to frighten them, or at least it didn't frighten them enough for them to turn away from Jesus. But showing up on that morning and finding an enormous stone, not acting as a barrier between life and death, but instead opening up a connection between heaven and earth, God and humanity, now that scared them. Wouldn't it scare you? It would scare me. It scared them enough to run away. It scared them into silence. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. After all, what do you even say when the impossible happens? 
Who do you tell when the world as we know it has been flipped upside down and nobody even knows it yet? Who do you tell when something so wonderfully amazing has happened that it frightens even the most courageous of people? Do you tell the disciples? I mean, they've been afraid for a while now. They were looking reality into the face and they ran away. Do you go and tell them? Somehow I don't think so. Do you go and tell Peter? Peter never knows what to say. Peter never even understands what's really going on in the first place. He's always a little confused. And Peter just pledged that he would never, ever abandon the Lord and yet denied him three times. Of course you don't tell him. And so these courageous, unshakable, faithful women said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. We all know fear. Fear is a very real aspect of our lives. For most of us, fear comes and goes. For some of us, it lingers longer and lives with us like an unwelcomed friend who just will not leave. And even the most courageous of people have fears. In the teen novel, Divergent, one of the strongest, most courageous characters has the nickname Four. Why? Because he has four fears. Even he is afraid of something. Most of us have more than four fears. Fear is present in our lives. I know it's present in mine. In the midst of COVID-19, I have different fears than I've had before. Fears of making someone sick by inadvertently infecting them with the virus. Fears of people I love becoming sick, suffering, and dying. I am afraid of the economic impacts of this disease on my community, the world, on families. I worry about what it's going to do for nonprofits, not only like the church, but other organizations that serve people who are living on the margins, doing really important work in feeding hungry people, in clothing others, in providing shelter and care, and ministry for people who are struggling with mental health. These are very real fears, and I try to contain them. I try not to let them get too large within my own body, and sometimes I just say them out loud to put them out into the universe. Somehow, it seems when I do that, they don't have the same power over me. And other times, I at least can name them to other people who might console me in my fears or at, la at least join in some solidarity, naming that they are afraid of those same things. I know many of you share my fears, and you have fears of your own as well. But in the face of these fears, I recognize that it is because of our Easter story that there is one thing that we do not need to be afraid of. We do not need to fear dying. I do not fear death because of this story. This outrageous, outlandish story is the reason that I don't waste any of my time worrying about death. This story that seems completely impossible, that defies logic and science, and yet, and yet there's something about it that speaks to me. At first, no one believed it. No one believed the women when they finally did say something. At least that's what the other Gospels tell us. In the Gospel of Luke, the disciples dismiss them and say that that is foolishness. And after years of struggling with my own questions about the resurrection, which, believe me, are many, the truth is my faith rests in this story. It rests in the promise that God gives us in this early morning miracle. As crazy as it may sound, I believe it. I believe it because we have a God who shows up in the midst of our fears with a message of life and a message of hope. We have a God who defies logic and who works through impossibilities to make things possible for those whom God loves. I believe it because we have a God who astonishes us time and time again, just like Jesus astonished the people with his healing and teaching throughout his ministry. 
God's transformational power is stronger than any rock that might stand in our way. It is more powerful than any government that might try to take us down. And it is even able to face death completely, submit to it, and still come out on top. We have a God who knows the power of corruption, the power of greed, the power of evil, and even the power of death who proclaims to us this morning that there is nothing more powerful than God's life, nothing more powerful than God's love, nothing more powerful than our God. This story does not end in fear. It ends in life. It ends in new life, realized in the face of death. There is good reason to be afraid of new life because it means that we had to first experience death to encounter it. And that is scary. I don't know about you, but I see demonstrations of new life around me every day. New life that comes in the face of fear and death that we are experiencing right now. Even in a time when we are physically distanced from one another, even in the midst of fear of disease and unemployment, God's love, God's hope, God's life is with us through the risen Christ. The risen Christ is alive in our world in hope and love. It lives on in people of faith and people of courage, love, and hope. The risen Christ lives on in courageous men and women who day after day show up in jobs that expose them to COVID-19 in order to care for others. The risen Christ lives on in courageous people who are raising up their voices in advocacy for their fellow employees attempting to get them protective gear or sounding the alarm so that the people they supervise can be protected and not exposed to the disease or they are speaking up on behalf of the marginalized so that they might be seen and cared for as well. The risen Christ lives on in goodbyes that are said over tablets and cell phones as family members go into hospitals alone. And sons and daughters, husbands and wives and partners receive health status updates over the phone. The risen Christ lives on in courageous people of faith who are afraid and yet each day continue to get up and do whatever they can in order to love their neighbor by putting up hearts on their houses, sending cards, teaching their kids while trying to work from home, and so much more. The risen Christ lives on in you. This has been a hard week for many of us. It has been a hard week for me. Someone I love is sick and in the hospital. And I have joined the many voices of people who have been praying for him day after day, night after night, week after week. And for a while, it looked like things were turning around. For a while, I had such hope. However, we learned on Wednesday that that hope we longed for was not to be. And most likely, my friend will die sometime this weekend. I have grieved, I have cried, I have shared my feelings with friends who have listened and cared and given me virtual hugs and sent me wonderful text messages of support, and I am so, so grateful. And I still grieve. But I do not grieve as someone who has no hope. I grieve as someone who has been nurtured in friendship and love, I grieve as someone who believes that this disease did not win, but that God's life, God's promise, will bring us together again. I grieve as someone who looks to the resurrection and healing power of what God can do in the face of death, and I am both fearful and thankful. It is okay for us to be afraid. It is okay for us to grieve. 
God's story doesn't end in our grief. It doesn't end in our fear. And our story doesn't end there either. Our fears and our grief will not stop us from proclaiming the good news. COVID-19 will not stop us from shouting, Alleluia, this morning. Easter morning might begin in a tomb, but it ends with courageous people running back out into the world who maybe aren't sure what to say yet, but know that the world has changed forever because of the risen Christ. And that is why today we can say something, not in fear, but in hope. Proudly proclaiming, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. Uplifted by the promised hope and healing and resurrection, we join now with the people of God in all times and places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God of resurrection, from the very beginning, you give the church the gift of the women who were the first witnesses to our Lord's resurrection. Be with all in our day of difficult times who serve as preachers, teachers, and leaders. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All your creation praises you. The earth hums, the seas pulse, the stars shine, and the galaxies whirl in glorious harmonies to honor you. Let us hear and blend our voices in the song. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Gather your community around all who need your healing power, especially Evelyn Dodds, Carol Potter, Robert Woodward, Bryce McArdle, Lyle Olson, Pastor Craig, Joe Bailey, Keith and Vicki Bresley, Amy Nelson, Lori Joe, Julie Swedberg, Tim Brown, Christopher Sluice, John Maleka, Kathy Lovick, and Judy Wold. Here are also the names of those we now name silently or out loud before you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, God, grant comfort, peace, and the hope of Christ's resurrection to all who grieve today. We pray especially for the family of Nancy Giddings, a Luther Seminary student, upon her death, Walt and Lois Vadner, upon the death of Walt's sister, Evelyn Ostfold. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we lift to you these prayers and the prayers of our hearts, trusting in your everlasting love and mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We want to thank you for your continued support in these difficult times with your offerings and tithes. We encourage that that be continued even as we express our gratitude.
we extend an invitation to you to participate in Holy Communion today. When Pastor Han proclaims the words of institution, we invite you to raise the bread and lift your own cup. And after he has broken the bread and said the words, this is the body of Christ given for you, and this is the blood of Christ shed for you, we invite you to receive communion and to distribute communion to other people who are gathered with you, saying those same words, this is the body of Christ given for you, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. For those who are not receiving Holy Communion today, receive this blessing. May God's love and presence surround you today, nourishing you in faith. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took some bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all, saying, This cup is the new promise in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Please join me in praying the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for your sins. Now may the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his precious blood strengthen and preserve you until life eternal. Peace be with you. Amen. Alleluia is not just a word. It is a way of living. How many ways can we share Alleluia? When the bread is divided. Alleluia. When the table is set. Alleluia. When the hungry are fed. When peace is celebrated, when communities are brought together, when neighbors love each other, when hope refuses to die. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. May the loving power of God, which raised Jesus to new life, strengthen you in hope, enrich you with love, and fill you with joy in the faith. In the name of the triune God, amen.